Good evening, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's presentation. We're going to give everybody about 20 seconds or so to enter the room. And as you enter the room, there's going to be a simple two-question poll. Uh, it'll take you all of 10 seconds. Are you a parent, a student, an educator? And then if you are a parent, student, uh, guardian, what grade are you or your student in? Um, so the room will fill up, just we'll give it another 30 seconds, and then we'll start doing introductions and talking about the plan for the night. There's always a plateau about half a minute. In. So we're happy you're here. Should be a good conversation on a nice, on a nice Wednesday. There's already a question. Let me open up my Q&A. Hey, Hannah Stoutman says hello. Larico Harmon, all right. We got peeps, we have plenty of colleagues on tonight, which is gonna be fun. And there'll be a bunch of folks who'll watch it later. We have a pretty pretty sizable turnout for this one. Um, and there'll be a recording. We're gonna send it out with, typically within a couple of days and it'll be yours. So, all right. Well, I think, I think we're starting to hit a plateau and then folks will trickle in over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, but yeah, do the poll and then let's dive in. So everybody, good evening again. Uh, I'm Dr. Jed Appleruth. Very happy to have you all here tonight talking about grade inflation, how to stand out when A is an average grade. So I have the, the, the pleasure to present tonight with uh, three of my colleagues, colleagues and friends, and I wanna give brief introductions to all three of them. Um, so pause for a moment. And first up, uh, Mary Tipton Woolley. With 25 years in the admissions profession, Mary Tipton Woolley is currently serving as the Interim Exec Director of Undergraduate Admissions at, at Georgia Tech, where she, uh, for the last 15 years, she's been in there. Prior to going to Tech, she was at Emory University, where she knew uh, most of my first tutors, because she was the uh, Director of Enrollment Services at Oxford College, where Natalie Henderson went and all of her smart tutors who were working for me from like 03 to you know, 07. Uh, Mary Tipton holds a BA from Mississippi State University in Psychology, and an MS from Georgia State University. Go Panthers! in urban policy studies. All right, next up, Dr. Belinda Wilkerson. Dr. Wilkerson is an independent ed consultant currently serving as the president of the Independent Ed Consultants uh, Association. Uh, she's a former secondary school teacher, um, a certified professional school counselor, and a counselor educator at Providence College. Married with two adult sons, she is also a proud Roddy mom. Go Rottweilers. All right, and last but not least, Tracy, TG. Casey Grunig graduated from Indiana University, uh, the Kelly School of Business. Uh, and when she finished her master's at Kansas State, she then spent two years as a, 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 the dean, um, under dean of uh, students at University of Chicago. Until March 97, she acted as the associate director of admissions for Chicago's grad school of business. Then she spent a year as an adjunct admissions officer for the UPenn's Wharton School of Business, where she traveled internationally to recruit and interview candidates. She's been in private practice at an IEC for 28 years. So we're talking a lot of incredible experience in this room. And um, so tonight's structure, pretty simple. Uh, I guess now I'll segue to the deck. And um, here we go here, I'll share my screen. I just want you to see all the faces as I was giving the introductions. So here we go. Uh, this is slideshow from beginning. All right, uh, so tonight's, the, the structure is this. I'm gonna tee us off with the foundation. Great inflation, what's going on? We, we hear it, we talk about it. What's some of the evidence? I'm a big data evidence guy. So I'll give you some of the evidence people have, have gathered over the years and looking at the trends, where it's happening, how it's happening and so forth. Uh, then uh, they are gonna hand off to, to the college side. And Mary Tipton, she's, you know, does admissions for many years at, over at Tech. What's it like reading, um, you know, for when students are coming and there are a lot of very lofty grades. What's that like? How do they read? How do they interpret grades? Then we're gonna to go to the, uh, the the IC and the student side, the family side. Um, we're gonna to go to uh, Tracy Grunig and then Belinda Wilkerson talking about when students come with, you know, uh, if parents come, my kid has all A's, how to put that in context in terms of, you know, I, you know I'm building my list because my kid has all A's. Like, well, let's talk about this. And how, you know, is that gonna make you stand out or what can you do to stand out? What, are, what, what things do make you stand out in the crowd? If, if the grades themselves aren't what they, what they used to be. So let us jump in. Uh, and again, we're gonna share this presentation. We're gonna send you a, a durable a, a video link uh, within a couple of days typically. All right, so first and foremost, defining it, grade inflation, what is it? It's the upward shift in distributions of the grades over time. 
that's not tied to the achievements of students. So grades are moving up, academic attainments really aren't moving. Then there's grade compression. We're seeing a lot of, you know, the defender vendors, a lot of kids are piling up toward the high end of the distribution. The range is getting pretty crowded in that, well, you know, kids from 95 to 100, and that's getting pretty stacked. Whereas before that was a little more spread out. So we're having a shift, uh, some skewing in the curve, a little kurtosis. Uh, here's a sample um, from a couple of years ago. This is pre-pandemic, pre uh, an actual private high school. Um, and the gray trends, you look at it, A pluses, we have a small portion, but the A's is the biggest share, A minuses. Um, we have, so a lot of kids, about two thirds of students are in the A range alone. Then you have the B's at 30, 30, 34%. So 97%, you, you capture all but three out of 100 kids in that top A and B bracket. And then you have a few kids with C's and then like one or two kids who have D's. So a lot of skewing towards the A's and then the B's. Um, here, um, Mary Kitchen and I gave a talk in Atlanta five years ago, and this was data from a, a public school that she'd shared with me, and they applied to, t t to tech. So the, uh, so the public school here in Georgia, the applicant GPA average was a 99.25. That's the average um, you know, of 100 or so kids. It's pretty amazing going to, the, to applying to tech. Um, and then they gave, you know, there's the min-max for the school. The admitted average um, for tech was 100.62. And so the lowest person getting into tech had a 96 and the highest at 103. And, um, and so that's giving you a sense of like, you know, my kid has A's, just putting that in context for, you know, for a strong public feeder here in, in Atlanta. Um, and so as a differentiator, this, this stat was pretty nuts. Mary Tipton shared with me a couple of days ago. Um, this is public information, it's all, it's all out there. But 56% of uh, admitted students from Georgia and 76% from non-Georgia have exclusively unweighted A's without a single B in the transcript. So that is amazing. If you're applying outside of Georgia, three fourths of kids don't have a single B who are admitted to tech, and which is amazing. Um, and so 86% of admitted students from Georgia and all but 4% of the non-Georgia students have all or mostly all unweighted A's, it's unweighted. This is not any, any quality points or credits. Um, and less than 1% of students admitted to, you know, from Georgia, and less than 0.3 from at non-Georgia students have unweighted grades that are mostly Bs or lower. So that's uh, just giving you a sense of, again, the ranges. So what grade inflation is, one thing if grades are rising and it's, it's you know, concomitant with other increases in academic achievement and attainment, but that's not what we're seeing. Um, grades are doing this dance up and up and up and up, but other objective standardized measures are going down. The NAEP, the Ed Progress International you know, Report Card, down. PISA International Student Achievement is down. SATs, they're down. AP exams, pretty much every other measure that's objective, you know, criterion-based you know, reference, it, they're all decreasing. Um, and so, and that's part of, there was a 2022 high school transcript study found that grades are up everywhere, but our actual abilities and performance uh, is down. So we're getting higher grades and more advanced classes without the corresponding gains in ability or attainment or achievement. That's, that's an issue. Um, and how does grade inflation work? And this is something I work with students individually and I talk to them about what's going on. And I, I've, I've been pretty amazed by learning about my students. They can take things two or three times. They can you know, retake things that they can turn in again. Like this is stuff I didn't have when I was a kid. Um, there's definitely been a change in some of the culture of grading. So there's a lot more opportunities for rework, resubmission. You can submit, you know, I can take it, take it three times, this quiz, like, three times. What does that even mean? For There are schools now where there's no more zeros. They felt zeros were too punitive. And if you turn in nothing, you get a 50. Um, and so, and kids understand this. There are kids who just want to pass, who they understand with the rework and retesting, they can not turn things in, do the basic minimum, and then still pass. Because there are no, no zeros at some high schools. Um, they're getting limited penalties for late work. Some of them are going away. They're giving more extra credit for partial work. Dropping the lowest test and quiz is very, very common among my, my students I work with. Um, more bonus points, um, curving to increase you know, the final grades. And then kids are getting graded and getting points on their grade for factors that are not tied to achievement. Um, their attitude, they're positive. They're showing good effort, motivation levels. They're participating, they're raising their hand. They are, they're attending, not have they mastered the content. And so that's where there's a disconnect. I have, I've earned, I have a grade for all these other reasons, but I still don't really know calculus. But my grade doesn't show how little I know. 
because I'm, you know, I have good attitude and I'm showing up and raising my hand and so forth. So there, there are some problems that are that are playing out objectively. And there's some studies from the ACT, um, but again, they're showing this nice uptick. This is all kids taking the test um, who self-report their grade point average and it's a slow rise up. But meanwhile, the composite scores phase T, they, they keep dropping. So grades are doing this and scores are going down. Um, similar performance on the SAT grades, again, have been rising, self-reported for the college board. Meanwhile, test scores keep dropping. Um, and then this is just uh, five bullets. Everyone's doing their own analysis, but it's all saying the same thing. Department of Ed on a 4 scale, we're seeing you know this nice rise in average GPA, and that's actually kind of dated. That's not 20 years ago. Um, but the Cooperative Institute uh, Research Program, so about 40% of kids um, have A averages up from 17%. And these, you know, I'm looking in the last last quarter century, like 50 years ago, C's, like, you know, things have really changed. I graduated, I was class of 94 uh, in my high school. And even like the average student had in the 80s, I learned uh, about 10 years ago, really shocked me. My high school, private school in Atlanta, the average was about 93. That was the average grade for, you know, for my high school, which was amazing. My sister down the street, a really good private school, she had honors. It was like a 91 was honors. She was class of, of 91. Um, then the, the average grade to get honors became a 97. And so it's like to get, you know, cum laude, you have to, like, there was so much more inflation at these schools. So the, and the private schools inflated first. The private schools got on the bandwagon very early, but then the publics and other schools followed. Um, so there's more research, uh, uh, Gene Twenge and Campbell, that just in twice as many kids are getting A's. The SAT showed the same thing. And so, you know, National Household Ed Survey, they're all showing that there's more and more kids getting A's and B's. So the, the challenge, though, is when you have the grades, but you don't have the skills. Um, and so we're, we're seeing a, a pretty big number of students, 2.4 million kids are graduating without their requisite skills in reading, writing, and math. That's a problem when kids are coming into college, then the workforce, where, you know, I have friends who are professors, and like, yeah, these kids, some of them can't write, some of them, there are other challenges they're having, but they, they graduated with their diplomas and their, and their good grades. 20% um, of freshmen entering college in 2000 required remedial coursework, and there's there's more since then. And then, you know, a lot of kids coming in and they, they have A averages, but they're still remedial in, in, this, in the courses. And that's a challenge. That was something I, I saw from like Georgia Tech, um, for Georgia State rather, where they were using test scores uh, in some cases, as a proxy for what do you actually know versus you know your grade in, in high school. That's where like you know ha I have an A average in, in in math, but then my on the ST I got a three seventy in math. So it's like there's a disconnect there, and they those test scores sometimes can help be a ballast. Um, this Mark Schneider, I, the quote cracked me up, but it's education runs on lies. And this person was a director of in Institute of Educational Sciences the research arm of Department of Education. So there's a federal employee responded to the high school transcript study that GPAs were up and NAEP scores down. It's like, what are, what are we doing? And this is someone, you know, at a federal, you know, federal level. And, and so one of the big challenges is we're losing the ability to predict who will do well in college and beyond when we don't, you know, when the high school grades aren't necessarily tethered or tied to actual knowledge and ability. Um, we've seen some of this from the more elite schools, Stuart, uh, David uh, Schmill over at MIT, was one of the first ones uh, several years back to bring back testing. He said, just getting straight A's doesn't tell us whether the students are going to do well here at MIT or not. A's alone aren't enough. We need more than that. And they that, that pushed them back towards testing. And then Raj Chetty, a lot of the conversation, a lot of the big changes happening around testing come from this enormous analysis. But Raj Chetty will eventually get the Nobel Prize. Um, you know, he's, if this, he's changing the game of analysis using these super enormous data sets that before this were unimaginable. But 2.4 million kids combining all these different you know, data sources. And he was looking at the applications uh, from the 12 Ivy plus schools, that's the Ivies, MIT, Duke, Chicago, and Stanford. And the research was this. And this to me is one of the most compelling things. If you're talking about grade inflation, like what's the problem? And I think this, this slide you know, typifies what's going what the, the issue is. On the left side, you see this pretty nice relationship, pretty strong R value, R squared, the ability to predict performance. You have, as test scores rise in lockstep fashion, so too does GPA in college. And these are, again, the 12 schools. This is the, the Ivies uh, and MIT in Chicago, Duke and Stanford. So as test scores rise, grades in, in college rise. 
Then on the right side, you have the predictive power of high school grades. And you see there's a problem here that as high school grades are going from a 3-1 up to a three, even a 4-0, performance at college doesn't really move that much. And that's something where like there is, there's an issue here. There's little relationship between high school GPA and success in college. And that that's part of the challenge we're seeing with this whole disconnection. So this, this to me is very powerful. And again, built on 2.4 million data points. It's huge. Um, and again, the, this, the grade inflation piece, if you read the announcements over the last eight months, all the schools going back to testing from February on, many of them are quoting this. In most cases, we can't predict you'll do well unless we can you know, consider testing besides um, alongside grades. Same thing over at Brown, Christina, um, Paxson. Test scores are a better predictor of success than high school grades. It's all from that same chart. High school GPA explains a lot less than testing alone, says Bruce Sacerdote over Dartmouth. So this is, honestly, if you ask why is testing coming back, it's it's predominantly this. This is one of the major factors. And then other other some other things too, but it's we can't get enough from grades alone because uh, they don't mean what they, what they meant 30 years ago when grades could have been enough. Um, and so we're losing some distinction and differentiation between students. It used to be, my, I, have, you know, I have a 3.9 or I have a 4.0, and that means something. That means a lot. And that means a little less, having a 3.9. Um, when again, when... 75% of kids getting into tech have only A's uh, out of state. And, you know, that, 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 so the A's themselves aren't as special as they were for us uh, as parents. Um, and so there's less useful as, as, as a sorting mechanism for, for kids. Um, and also it's pushing more kids. So if grades aren't as special, then I've got to differentiate by rigor. Then I need 11 or 12 APs. How do I stand out if it's not through grades? And that's putting more pressure and more stress on kids. But then the grade inflation has these other ancillary costs that are, that are you know, these knock on effects. Um, and too much rigor in your curriculum, as we all know, can be can cause kids to be stressed out and more anxious and they have less fun and all these other things. Um, and I mentioned the private schools. So my, my private school, there was pressure at first because parents are paying and they, they want to return on their investment and they, they, they put pressure on the administration. They call the, you know, they, and they, put, and they call the teachers. Um, so the private school kids move first, then they're really affluent publics. But then over time, um, we see some some catch up among the the lower income schools, and then everyone realizes the game, and then suddenly like the you know the, the more higher poverty free and reduced lunch schools begin playing as well. Um, so that's something that we were seeing too. And the pandemic was not helpful for this trend. The pandemic happened, and we all know what happened when kids went remote. Some kids were back pretty quickly. Some kids were remote for a year. Um, and there are teachers who, like they told their kids, we're not going to cover half the curriculum for AP Chem. Therefore, you know, we're grading on a very different curve and there are very different expectations for performance and grading got a little bit softer during that time. And for some, it hasn't come back. And then and part of the challenge also, it locked in some learning loss there, you know, some kids are a year behind, some kids are a quarter behind. Um, and, but that's, that's changed some of the grading cultures and, and so forth after the pandemic. And another piece of it, we're talking about the high school side, but there also is great inflation on the college side. There have been articles in the past year about like at Yale, eight and 10 grades given at Yale are A's and at Harvard, it's very similar. This wasn't the case 30 years ago. It wasn't the case at all 50 years ago. It's just kind of, a, you know, these are our, our paying clients. Let's give them what they want for grad school before it's no, the grades we're going to give 20% A's, not 80% A's. So it's a, the culture of grading has totally shifted um, in America for a lot of reasons. And that's kind of the foundation. That's the background. And I'm going to hand things over uh, and I'll advance your slides to Mary Tiffin Willie. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks for letting me get in a couple of yoga poses and like some tea. You were discussing how long Jed was going to speak before I was up. So um, thanks for ever. Thanks everyone for joining us, whether it's your dinner time or your tea time or pajama time. Um, thanks for taking time either with or away from your family tonight to join us. And thanks Jed for including me. I'm just going to share a little bit of information about what we're seeing, obviously at Georgia Tech. Highly selective institution for first year admission for 2024. We had just under 60,000 applications for an enrolling class of about 3,900 students. Um, so we're admitting Georgia students uh, in the mid 30% is our admit rate for Georgia students and our non-Georgia students are admitted below 10%. I just say that to give you a foundation for what 
my perspective and what I'm bringing to this um, coming from a highly selective institution. I will say, as I was listening to Jed and looking at some of his slides and seeing some of your questions coming in and thinking that other universities were they to join us would be giving you perhaps some similar and yet also some different information um, in terms of what their applicant pool is looking like and what is happening on their campus. But let me share a little bit about what's happening at Georgia Tech and what I hear from some of my colleagues around the country. So you heard um, Jed talk a little bit about our applicant pool that is outstanding. We have students that are excelling in high school. Um, it is really challenging for students to distinguish themselves with grades. Having good grades, taking rigorous courses, those kinds of things are what, as I like to describe to students, get you into the conversation, right? Like that's an expect, it's a baseline expectation to get you into the conversation, especially in a selective admission category. I included some information here about courses and about testing, just because I don't want you to think that it's just about grades. There is a lot of stuff happening on the other side. There's absolutely, Jed kind of talked about this at the end of his slides, but this incredible, in some schools, incredible pressure to increase the number of rigorous courses that our students are taking, often to their detriment, as we see the pressure that that is putting on students, um, the workload that frankly is, is unsustainable. Let me talk about that again in just a minute, but I thought I'd give you a real life example because you know, we, we talk with families and then we also talk with people once decisions are made. And um, it can be very challenging to explain why does a school like Georgia Tech make the decisions we make? Because we are making decisions often that have to do with institutional priorities and trying to fit students into a first year class that's going to fulfill all the things we need to do at our institutions. And then trying to explain that to somebody that hasn't seen the 60,000 applications coming through the pipeline. So I thought I'd use one school as an example. And you heard Jed talking about one from a few years ago. Um, this is one of our largest feeder high schools where we had over 330 applications from one school. Those app, This school does rank students, even though most students, most schools don't do that anymore. Let me just say that. But for sake of this conversation, it makes my example easier. We had the number one student apply and we had the 735th student apply. So you can see like pretty, pretty good range there, though most students were, were packed up pretty close to the top. And the average GPA for the 330 some odd students was a 4.12, so over a 4.0. We had to get to the 256th applicant, not ranked, just like my Excel spreadsheet, line number 256, before I got to a student that had below a 4.0. 94 of those students had straight A's, no B's. We admitted 96 students. We did not admit all the kids with straight A's. A third of the students we admitted did not have straight A's. And so that alone is telling you that that is not the one thing that's going to get a student admitted, right? But I can tell you that when we start to look at some of the students that you would call lower in the applicant pool, let's put really large air quotes around lower in that applicant pool. Um, those tend to be kids in perhaps where they've shown a really good fit to a major. They're in some of our more diverse, like not some of the super high demand majors. That makes sense, right? Like we're trying to meet institutional priorities. One of those being enrolling an academically distributed class. Um, I just use that as an example. That is school is a terrible example. That is a place where like the pressure is ratcheted up on students in a way that I wouldn't want my own child to be a part of. Um, I don't think it's necessarily, um, you know, but it gives you a sense of when we are looking at students and sometimes the conversations we have is like, well, why did you take Sally when her grades are lower than Susie's? I'm like, well, yeah, but Sally has a 94.35 and Susie has a 94.98. And sure, they're like 30 spots apart in their class rank, but there's only a difference of an A minus in that mix, right? Like these are, this is the kind of conversation that we're having. So I say that to sort of lay some groundwork. Um, the other thing I'll just say from the high school side, when I started in an admission, it was very common for us to receive from high schools that did robust profiles. This is how we get information about high schools. We know, understand the curriculum that's being taught. We understand some things about the school population. And in the past, we would have gotten some pretty good information about a grade breakdown. So like how many students in their senior class have A's, how many have B's, sort of what's their grade distribution. And actually, some schools even did it by the class. So you could be like, man, that 
junior chemistry teacher is killing those kids with all those C's. Like you could sort of kind of see those types of things. We never see that anymore. And so that type of sort of transparency of what's happening at a school is missing for us in a way that means we're left to rely even more heavily on what we see on a transcript and it starts to look more similar. One of my colleagues says this well, that when things start to, when the, when the band, the range of students starts to compress, it just starts to put pressure on other parts of the application and makes a decision that much harder to explain to someone. So next slide, Jed. You know, the one thing that's interesting, Jed was talking about like, or I think there was a question in chat, like, well, what's happening at colleges? Does this mean students aren't doing as well in college? I can tell you that there are some specific pockets of learning gaps that myself and my colleagues are very concerned about. And those tend to be exacerbated in certain school populations, um, especially some of our more underrepresented rural area schools where there aren't often teachers ready to teach upper level STEM classes. And as an example, which obviously matters to a school like Georgia Tech, but in general, sometimes it's hard to argue with more A's being given out in high school. When you look at what I'm showing you here, which is like over a 10 year span, we're seeing students making better grades, but I think actually more important to this conversation, retaining and graduating at higher rates than they did before. And so, you know, I, sometimes I sit back and I say, well, maybe more students do just have A's now. I, I sometimes ask that question. I, I think from an admission perspective, I'm not here to necessarily judge the decisions schools are making about grading. I can only look at the pool of students we have in that year and make decisions that make a fit for us. So this is sort of the like, I feel like I started this presentation as like, you could call it bad news. I'm going to call it the reality. But let's talk about where actually grades could make a difference in some things for a student. So next next slide, Jed. And this one has a few clicks. So I think you got to click, yeah, like one at a time. Okay, so let's start here. Uh, there are multiple states now, including the state I live in, where if you earn a certain grade, have certain courses, certain test scores, some combination of that, depending on the program, you may be guaranteed a place, an admission spot at a university in that state. The state of Tennessee is one of the newest states to start this kind of program. The state of Georgia is as well, but I figured I'd pick on somebody outside of the state of Georgia, at least for part of this. Um, but the state of Tennessee, which is my home state where I grew up, if you are in the top 10% of your high school class in Tennessee, or you have a 4.0 or higher, what they call the UT core GPA, which I don't know how they calculate that, but I bet you can find out. Then you are guaranteed a place in admission. I happen to know that the University of Tennessee has experienced, first off, I know from a news article I just read this week that more students are headed to college in Tennessee this year than in many of the last few years. And the University of Tennessee, their admission for out-of-state students, their admit rate went way down this year because they have a higher demand from in-state students. Mm -hmm likely because of a program like this. Because if you're a family out there saying like, man, I know the bar. I know like what it's going to take to be admitted. That's a good feeling to have in admission. So what's some other ways that numbers might make a difference? I picked on another state. Let's pick on Georgia for a second. Okay. You can pop up both of these if you, the next two clicks. Um, yep. These two. Perfect. So if you're in Georgia or if you know about the state of Georgia, we have an incredibly generous lottery funded scholarship for students that is based on mostly on numbers. And so if you have a certain GPA, that's going to be one of the criteria that's going to get you in the door for the Hope or the Zell Miller scholarship. So now we're talking about scholarship dollars, not just admission to a school. My last example um, from another public flagship in the South, I won't say their name because this is actually a fairly common type of thing for universities to do, which is to give kind of a rubric. If you have this test score and these grades, we're going to give you this much money to come to our school. And you know that before you even apply. So like, I know sometimes it's a strategy for students, like if I could just retest and get my ACT one point higher, I'm going to get this much more money. So when you say like, do the grades matter? I mean, in this case, yeah, they're going to give you a pretty good indication if you're eligible for not just admission, but also scholarship dollars at places. Okay, last slide, last thing uh, to hear from me. So like I said, kind of the reality, what I think is maybe in a way like good news, I think this idea of what are benchmarks, what's the bar I have to meet can be a reassuring part of a process that often feels much more opaque than that. 
Um, but one of the questions that we talked about as we were preparing for this was like, as a student, how can I distinguish myself outside of grades? Like if everybody has the same grades, how can I make myself stand out? Well, the reality is that grades, the courses that you've taken, again, this is sort of, I always describe it to families as like, this is what gets you, it's like your ticket into the conversation, right? It is a baseline expectation. Please don't hear me say like, you may never make a B in high school. But if a student, here's like a common question at admission. Is it better to have, let me see if I get this right. Is it better to have a B in an AP class or an A in a regular class? However you phrase it at your high school. And I don't like that question because the real answer is most of the students that apply to us mostly have A's in AP classes. That's the reality at selective admission. So one of the things you should be thinking about if this, if what I'm saying is making you nervous is sometimes you just need to think about other types of universities. There are so many universities out there that absolutely want every single student that's on this call tonight or students that you're working with or your children or your kids that you're supporting there are schools that are excited to have them because they're a good fit and they have qualities that they're excited about. But I know that often we focus a lot on schools like Georgia Tech to the detriment of sort of the, the big conversation about college. So I think broadening the horizon, and I know my colleagues um, on the counseling side are going to talk a little bit about that here in just a few minutes. But like I said, academics get you in the conversation. But the truth of the matter at a selective school is a lot of the decision is outside the control of students. That doesn't feel great. You know, like we want to kind of be in control of all of it, right? But the truth of the matter is, you know, I'm charged with enrolling a first year class of 3,900 students. If a student comes to visit Georgia Tech or they call me and they say, and they're from, we'll pick on Tennessee again. They're from Tennessee. Why didn't I get into Georgia Tech? The first thing I say is, the number one reason is because you don't live in Georgia. Like that is the number one reason. We are a public university in the state of Georgia. It is an institutional priority that we enroll the large majority of our students from the state of Georgia. So when you hear universities talk about things like institutional priorities, fit, like trying to bring in a mix that they've been charged with, that's the, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Academic distribution is another major piece of that, right? The application also matters. I 60,000 applications. I'm not sitting down and talking with all those students. So we don't have capacity to do that. So students have to be able to put together an application that we can review and get to know who they are and why they're going to be a good fit for us. And they're doing that through the application. It might not be the format you want, but turning in all those little blanks and fields that you can fill in on the common application Learning how to express yourself in the space that you have there is incredibly important. And I always tell students being your own best advocate, kind of tooting your own horn, which is hard for all of us, that's incredibly important when you're applying to college. The last thing I'll just mention here, this is kind of a new phrase I've been saying. Y'all can tell me what you think. It's like, a, I'm like a year in of using this, but admission is not additive. When students are like, what's that one more thing I can do? I'm like, it's it's not additive. You can't keep piling on stuff. You can't keep doing more. That is that is not feasible. That's not healthy for you. It's not healthy for your family. And I think at some point you have to know that if you're putting yourself into a selective admission pool, all you can do is set yourself up throughout high school by challenging yourself with courses, doing as well you can in those classes, figuring out how you can make an impact on those around you in whatever way, and then doing a search that gives you a broad range of schools that are going to be a good fit for you and for where you're going to be a good fit for them. And then last but not least, like just sort of packaging that and displaying that in your application. I'm going to stop there because I know my colleagues that have so much expertise um, helping students as they're going through this process have some words of wisdom to share as well. So let me turn it over. Thank you, Mary Tiffin. All right, and now we're going to hand things over to Tracy Gernick. Good evening. Thank you for joining all of us this evening. I think this is going to be a super helpful um, webinar for everyone. Um, Mary Tipton, you're, you're a tough act to follow. So I just want to start with, um, as an IEC, I do feel like my main role is to help families and students manage their expectations through the process. And to Mary Tipton's comments, just making sure that families understand there's a school out there for everyone. And you, students and parents, um, 
need to select the coursework that is most developmentally appropriate for that student. I think families are, are continually feeling the pressure to take as many advanced placement courses as they possibly can, where it's it's not it may or may not be appropriate. And I I feel like my role is to really help families and students choose the courses that are going to challenge them, but appropriately so. Um, I love your your comments, Mary Tipton, about um, should I get a you know, is it better to get a B in an advanced placement course as opposed to taking an on-level course? And and my answer to that question is is very similar. Neither. You want to get an A in the AP course. <laughs> but you also want to take an advanced placement course in an area that's of interest to you. Don't take an AP just because it's going to look good on your transcript. Um, these poor kids are under such a tremendous amount of pressure. And I feel like part of my role as an IEC is to help them really figure out what they're passionate about, what they're interested in, in and out of the classroom, and how to package themselves appropriately in the application to make it as easy as possible for an admissions officer to take a 10-minute glance at that application and really get gain an understanding of who that student is and what makes them tick. So I wanted to give you all a, a couple of different examples. Um, I work with students from all ends of the academic and extracurricular spectrum. I have some students who are full IB diploma candidates and are just are crushing it in the classroom. I have other students who may have one or two APs on their transcript. And again, there's a place out there for every student. And making them feel like you're this is not the race to nowhere and you're going to find a place that's going to be appropriate for you. Um, so I work a lot on the college resume and the activities list with my students to help them figure out what it is that they want to spend their time doing outside of the classroom and how they can stand out in the actual application process. So when I work with a student on their college resume, I have them organize their resumes around their areas of interest and what they do outside of the classroom that, that helps them stand out. And I like to start this resume during the freshman or sophomore year. So we have some runway to make some really effective decisions about through high school about how to accentuate those areas of interest. So let me give you a couple of examples. I had a student, a really high end type A student come to me uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, she was in student council. She had a ton of rigor on her transcript. She went to a private alternative high school. She's a pianist, a ballerina and she's trilingual. I mean, the information just kept coming. And I was like, oh my gosh, it was all over the map. So I was like, all right, how can we package this student in, in a way that communicates all the amazing things that she is doing at some mid-level state universities and some more selective schools as well? And we were really trying to leverage scholarship for this particular student. This was very, very important for their family. Um, and her areas of interest ended up being an accomplished dancer and pianist, and she had plenty of things to support that concentration. She was an enthusiastic linguist. Um, she was a passionate leader and a dedicated volunteer, author, and advocate. If an admissions officer has all of 30 seconds to look at that resume, they would very quickly understand who this student was. And she communicated that through her, her college resume. And we did the same thing through her activities list. Let me give you a, a, a kind of a, a dichotomous example in that I had a student who, a, a young man who, he was involved, but not, in not a lot of leadership. Um, he took a couple of APs, but not extensively. I think he took two or three. Um, and he came to me and I felt so so bad for him in that he was just like, I really, there's nothing special about me and about my application. And that absolutely broke my heart. And I said, honey, there's something special about you that you don't even understand yet. And how can we package your interests? Um, and he said, well, but I don't really have any interests. And once we dug a few layers deeper, he started peeling back the layers of the onion. And he goes, wow, I'm actually doing more than I thought I was doing. Because most teenage, most teenagers minimize their accomplishments because they look at the competition out there. Everybody's getting A's. Everybody's splitting the atom. Um, everybody's, you know, curing cancer. And that just, I'm just really not that special. 
And so as an IEC, I just think it's really important to help these students understand what on a, on a deeper level, who they are and how they can advocate for themselves through the application process. And in my opinion, when I get a call from a family who, you know, Susie Q and Johnny are, you know, they're, they're great. They're getting all A's. So we have a list of Ivies that we're, we're going to be applying to is managing expectations and say, you know what, let's make sure we're curating a well-rounded list of schools. Um, so Johnny and Susie Q have lots of options where they feel really good about themselves and are going to be engaged in their higher education. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tracy. Appreciate that. Um, and now we're going to go to our, our last uh, um, last speaker tonight, Belinda Wilkerson. Let me um, go over there. All right. Dr. V, you're up. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I loved everything you just said, Tracy, because it is all about managing those expectations. But like you and I know many of my colleagues also, we're really helping students craft those activities lists. I mean, some kids come to us and we have to have them you know, pare it down a little bit because they want to put <laughs> everything in there plus the kitchen sink. But there are kids that come in and like you said, they don't understand sometimes what they're doing and how much they're doing. So what I've been doing, so I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of some things that I've done with kids. Some kids have graduated now from high school and from college. Some are in the middle of, of doing this. So one student I worked with was very interested in um, computer engineering, computer science and was doing all those things, had the grades that Mary was talking about, was you know doing robotics, was winning state competitions. So what are you, how are you going to differentiate yourself? So one of the things I started having students do as they're thinking about careers is to look into the professional associations that have to do with those particular careers. So this young man was, um, I had him look into the National Society for Black Engineers, which does have high school chapters in a variety in a multiple states. So there happened to be one in his state near his city, had him join it. So he started getting the mentorship there and what have you, was able to speak in his essays even more to what he wanted to do because he had had these conversations with these professional people. He continued on with that association, that organization, through college, I was looking on his LinkedIn account. That was another thing. I had him create a LinkedIn account. And at the end of his first year, he had this like fantastic internship with Raytheon. So I, you know, sent him a message on LinkedIn. I said, how did you get this? He goes, well, you know that thing you made me join? <laughs> I'm like, okay, I made you join it. He said, so I went to one of their conferences and was talking to, you know, the different people, different companies there. And talk to Raytheon, talk to Google, talk to Microsoft. Every year, he had a wonderful internship in the summer that was paid. And it all started because he joined that organization and, and stayed with it. So folks, that's a great thing to do to look into the professional associations, as especially for kids who pretty much know what they want to do or think they know what they want to do. You know, um, connecting with those folks. Uh, another young lady that I worked with was very much into um, political science, public health, because of a health concern that she had as a student. Um, she, she, had, she had diabetes, and, and she saw how sometimes school policy was not always in her favor sometimes, you know, in a public school. So she went on to college and uh, really started honing in on looking at that. But before that, she was very much a student activist. So she was talking about it. She decided she was going to make this her mission in high school to the point where she, at one point, she testified before um, her state legislature about um, that stuff. So when she's telling me all this stuff and she goes, oh, and they interviewed me. I was in the newspaper. And I said, so how would people know that about you? And she said, well, I guess I could put on my app. I said, but how would they know about it before they get your application? So created a LinkedIn account, showed her how to upload her videos and and put in her uh, articles and then had her start connecting to people that she had already came in contact with in that area. So again, it's helping students understand how to use LinkedIn to build those relationships that might help them not necessarily with admissions, but helps them as far as when they're work, writing their essays and they need to really clarify what they're interested in and why they're interested in it. 
and also being able to connect with people in the field. Um, another student. So here's for the student who, like you said, you know, I'm not really doing much. So this young lady was working. She had a job um, and ended up. So one of the things I do with students, if they have a job at every meeting, we're talking about. So what did you learn in your job this week or this month? Uh, what kind of skills did you learn? What was the worst thing that happened at work? What was a good thing that happened at work? So this particular young lady had, over time, her um, supervisor recognized her leadership skills that she didn't necessarily know she had and promoted her to the shift supervisor, to her complete surprise. So I said, okay, so tell me, tell me about how you are at work. So she talked about she's always on time. If she sees something that needs to be done and she's not necessarily busy, she goes ahead and does it. I said, okay, taking the initiative, here you go. Always trying to um, really get along with other teammates. And I said, so when you became the team leader, how did your peers treat you? She goes, at first it was a little difficult. She said, because it's like, oh, you think you're this now because you're the boss. But she said, I just kept on talking to them and you know, not letting it go to my head. But here's another thing I remember her telling me. She said, I had to learn patience. I said, what do you mean patience? She goes, well, you know, older people come into the restaurant and now we have all these electronic kiosks where they have to order their food and they don't necessarily know how to do it. She said, so rather than getting frustrated, I just go over there and walk them through it. And she goes, and I've learned that I have to be patient with people. And she goes, and I find that going into how my relationships are with some family members that kind of get on my nerves. So again, having those conversations with kids really helps them start thinking about things. Um, I love for students to be able to job shadow when they have the opportunity. You know, reach out to people because you need to find out, is this a job that I really want to be in? What's it like? Because everybody, oh yeah, I want to be a doctor until somebody says, oh yeah, but I don't like blood. Okay, let, but that's not going to work. So find those opportunities to job shadow. So students will say, well, well, I don't know anybody. I said, okay, you want to go in the medical field. Do you have a doctor? Do you go to a dentist? You know, to use the network that you already have. It doesn't necessarily have to be somebody new. Ask them. And you'll be so surprised, I told them. I said, when you ask one of your physicians or your dentist or whoever you're seeing in whatever field that you're looking for this opportunity, even if they can't help you, they may find somebody else that can help you. That also goes along with informational interviews. So you can't job shadow, do a job shadow, but you can do an informational interview. And because of the wonders of Zoom, you don't have to do it in person. Um, so you can find those connections. So one of my students right now is so interested in public transportation, wanted to do an internship in public transportation. I'm like, okay, how am I, do you know anybody? He didn't know anybody. I happen to belong to the North Carolina Career Development Association. And folks, there's definitely usually a chapter in every one of your states. If not, you know, look at the, Nat, uh, the National Career Development Association. So I went on our Facebook page, on our LinkedIn page, actually, and I asked members of the Career Development Association. I said, hey, do any of you in North Carolina know somebody in the Department of Transportation? I have a young man that blah, blah, blah. Within 24 hours, I had a name. By the next day, I had the student and this person connected. So they're now connected, and this student is going to be learning about public transportation through the Department of Transportation in North Carolina because of that connection. So again, it's helping students do that. Now, one of my favorite ones, because I started doing it myself, you know, not every kid can go out and work. Not every kid can get these internships. So what else can we do? Um, so one of the things I started doing... Um, post-COVID was um, I started volunteering for this organization called Lasagna Love. What you do once you sign up as a volunteer is you decide how often you're going to make a lasagna and deliver it to a family that has requested it through this organization. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because you can see it on the website, but it is so, it's set up so great. I just, earlier, just before we did this, I was responding to the person that I'm now doing one for it this weekend. Um, if you're under 18, you do have to have a parent join also. But again, that's something. And just recently, they have now collaborated with the Girl Scouts, and there is a Girl Scout patch for lasagna love. 
that is new. And if you go on their website and look under the Girl Scout patch, they give you so many ideas of how to do this at every level of Girl Scouts. Um, another one, and this is actually one, and I know we'll, you know, we're almost there, so I'll wrap up. Um, one of my students turned me on to this. So he was very much interested in philosophy and history and what have you. And he had this activity on his list. And I said, what is that? So it's the Smithsonian Digital Volunteers. They are looking for people to transcribe records. And it's so, so he was showing what he was doing. So you go on there, you sign up as a volunteer and you look at the different documents that they need transcribed. And you can pick and choose what you want if it's available. So again, that was something like so cool because I had never heard of it. And I said, well, how did you know about that? Well, this was a kid who read the Smithsonian Magazine. So that's how he found out about it. But it's something for everyone. Another thing, because I'm really passionate about libraries, when I have kids telling me that they're interested in creative writing and they want to know about writing and books and what have you, I said, your local libraries all do author talks. It costs you nothing to attend these talks and the authors are probably there at least once a month you know they rotate them through the libraries I said go to these talks talk to the author afterwards find out information that's the way they now get an informational interview but again find out that whole process so one of the things so again just reiterating there are ways that you can differentiate yourself without turning yourself into a pretzel you know and making yourself crazy um, so looking for these different opportunities and, you know, thinking outside the box. And as, as Tracy said, really managing expectations, because not everybody's going to be out there curing cancer and becoming neuroscientists and all that other stuff. So I'm going to stop there because I know we're getting close to time. Excellent. Well, thank you. So many excellent examples and ways that your students have found a way to stand out in the crowd. Um, so we, we have some questions already coming in. And please uh, use the Q&A. Oh, and uh, yes, we have a quick follow-up poll. It is three questions. It'll take you again about 15 seconds. Go ahead and go through that if you want anyone to reach out or any support in any way. Um, and we're going to shift to the Q&A. So we have a few questions about APs, and I'm going to open this up and let you guys answer. Um, my students get mostly A's and B's, but due to health reasons, got a C and AP pre-cal, but you got a five on the AP exam. How can my student explain this to college admissions and does it really have, a, have an effect on his chances with colleges like, like tech? So get, well, getting a C in AP pre-cal, I guess, Mary Tipton, do you wanna tackle that one? Yeah. Um, so first off, students can tell us if they know their AP scores when they complete their application. They have a place to report those. This is gonna be school dependent, but let me just, PSA say like for a lot of schools, you can self-report via the Common app or whatever application platform they're using and save the consternation and money of sending scores until enrollment. So let me just say that part. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about EP. Actually, I'm trying to like figure out what I want to say. What I will just say is the difference in grades and test scores. Grades do, they are, a, they are the best exhibit of the day in, day out work, school, like the effort that happens day in and day out. Test scores are, they're like a one-time thing, right? And some students are better at that than others. That's the reality of it. And some situations are better than others with testing. And so I, I have never heard a college admission person say anything different than what I'm about to say, which is that like day in and day out work is going to have more impact on how we review a file than that one-time test score. But it doesn't mean we're ignoring that. And most importantly, it doesn't mean we're ignoring any kind of special circumstance. That's a great example of something though, that if a student doesn't tell us They've left us to our own imagination, which is a really dangerous thing to do when we've been reading file after file after file. So any kind of thing on a transcript that you feel may be what I would just call a blip, something that looks a little bit different, some kind of something that's different from what expected, you should you should tell us what's going on and whatever is a, an appropriate way to advocate. This does not mean a student needs to go into it's become really common for students to turn this into something sort of dark and like it's it's bad and this sort of like traumatic thing. I um, 
I think it's more helpful to like state the facts of what happened and why that was different from you from the past. That's enough, but don't lead us to our own imagination because that's dangerous. There are a couple questions about APs, actually like four Yeah. Um, on this. And one of them is, have schools thought about requiring AP exams um, that would level the field? Or, and also since grade inflation is evident again, yeah, it would. And you answered that to, you know, for, for tech in terms of looking at the, the spectrum and the full activity versus a single two hour moment in time, um, which, you know, kids can have a bad day. That does happen. They can have an off, they can not, not feeling well. Man, just in 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 this terms of on the broader scale, I know that you know Yale just made a a move to be test flexible. That um, and it was mostly for kids in California because some some of them are having a hard time getting access to the SAT in Cali. It's still a problem over there. Um, but their thing is we need a test score, um, and they their evidence shows that the same as the STAT correlate pretty well with uh, grades at Yale. So to do AP scores and IB scores. Um, so you're allowed to spend either your ST scores or ST scores or all of your APs or all of your IBs and, and all of them. You can't pick and choose. And it's, if you're going the, the path of the APs, send it all. But I think they're standing alone right now with that, you know, that option of either required. Uh, and otherwise, you, you you have the choice. And, and you know, like Tracy, you were in admissions in, in Chicago. And like if a student does send a lot of strong AP scores or from Mary Tipton, if someone does send a lot of like, you know, they've taken nine APs and they're sending you eight of them and they're predominantly fives and a four or two in there. Like how does that affect or impact the read? In, in, in my opinion, it impacts the read significantly. And just that I, I see a mastery of content, um, you know, within that particular score with that being said to, to Mary Tipton's point, um, you know, not all teachers are created equal in an AP course. So a lot of, oftentimes a teacher's performance in the classroom in teaching students some material for an AP exam in one high school on one end of town can be absolutely fantastic. And on the other end, in another high school can be dismal at best. Um, so you, you kind of have to take the AP score with a grain of salt as well. But when a student performs well on, you know, many, many AP exams, I, I understand a mastery of material. But when they're, to Mary Tipton's point, when there's a disconnect between the grade and the actual AP score, you want to use the additional information section in common application to very objectively explain where that disconnect happened and not leave it up to the imagination of the admissions officer. Because I will, as an admissions officer, I will err on the side of a question mark and not understanding that unless you tell me. We're, we're getting a, okay, Mary Tipton. The only thing I was going to just say is I do think you tend to see, um, AP score trends within a school. And yeah. it's exactly what Tracy just described. Like if you're, if the students are taking the class with the same teacher and the same kind of test prep for the test day for the AP score, there, yeah. there's tends to have clustered scores on AP exams. Um, and I think that's important. The other thing I just want to say about AP, because I see this floating in here that I, I should have said this earlier, course rigor is it's, it's based on opportunity, right? Like what is available at your school that your child, you, your child, person you're working with attends, like what's available to them. We don't expect students to like, you know, drive over to another school, three neighborhoods over and take classes there. I know that that is, that conversation has changed in the last decade because of the proliferation of dual enrollment and some of those kinds of things. But generally speaking, like what's available at your school. So like there's a specific question about when AP begins to be available, like because we're looking at the student within the context of their school. So if everybody starts taking APs in the sophomore year, then I'm not expecting to see four APs as a freshman, which for the record, I don't think is a good idea for most students. No. And this, the family's calling now asking about AP in middle school. Good grief. Come on, y'all. Like, let's just figure out getting to high school first. <laughs> it's crazy. That's amazing. And yeah. there are a couple of the questions we, we hear a lot in terms of, well, dual enrollment versus AP and then low AP scores. Should you submit your ones and twos? I mean, there are very few people who say send your ones and twos unless you don't, <laughs> you know, typically you withhold those. Typically it's, you look at the school, it, did, did they give credit for that for a four? For, like for applying to 
certain schools, they only give credit for a five, even sending a three may not be that helpful um, based on, you know, what is performance? And it varies. I would send a three to certain schools, but not to other schools. But a one and a two, typically that's not performance. Uh, and I wouldn't, you, you know, it's you, you, you want to put your best foot forward and submit things that strengthen, not things that weaken. Because you can't, I heard someone tell me it was a, a, a elite East Coast school. You can't unsee a number. You can't, if it's, you put it in there and you didn't have to send it, but now it's in the conversation. And now you had a 93 in that AP Cal class, you sent me a one. And now it's like, I can't, now I'm contextualizing that 93 with that one right there. It's like something happened, but I don't know who's that. So it's like, I, I you fill in the gaps and make a narrative or story of what, what happened. But I'd rather you not tell me you got a one. Um, and that's something from an admissions officer and admissions director. Um, I, so it's, it's actually nine o'clock. And uh, I think you did pretty good. I think uh, Dr. B is answering one of the questions there. Uh, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like we uh, we covered some it's the broad spectrum of grades, putting them in context, um, ways of standing out. I want to thank so much our panel, Mary Tipton, uh, Tracy, um, Belinda. You guys were you were excellent, and uh, I hope we'll do this again and soon. I, I've enjoyed speaking with you all before and and tonight. Um, so everyone, again, there'll be a recording going out to, uh, to to everybody, and feel free to share it. Feel free to have any questions to email us, um, and we'll you know be happy to pass things on to to our uh, our guest panel tonight. So everyone, once again, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you, uh, our, our three our three panelists, and everybody have a great evening. <laughs>